Ya, ya, dia 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 uh, entrepreneur saja. Ya, yeah, entrepreneurs. Ya. Yeah. <laughs> Cocok dengan seminar ini. Ya, dia entrepreneur. Jadi dia work very hard. Uh, okay. Okay, um, maybe we can start. Yeah, some of yeah. the students already in the Zoom uh, room. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Siti Aziza. Uh, I'm a moderator here, and also have a, uh, Dr. Irfan Junaidi uh, who helped me with the uh, with, in this seminar. Yeah. Uh, good to see you all, and it is great to have. Uh, the seminar about uh, agribusiness project planning and management. And Alhamdulillah, and thank you for uh, participating in uh, this seminar. I would like to welcome uh, Professor Mat Nasir Shamsuddin as our speaker today, and also my partner, Dr. Irfan Junaidi, and all of you, the participants from all of our many places in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, uh, we will talk about project planning and management which is a uh, key factor in business projects. And uh, Prof. Nasir Samsudin will talk about the success story in agripreneurship and uh, how to create business ideas and strategic planning in agribusiness. And here, this uh, hopefully we will find some outlooks that hopefully enrich our knowledge in creating uh, planning and managing agribusiness. Um, project yeah i will uh, yeah i will read uh, prof nasir samsudin uh, short curriculum vitae uh, prof mat nasir samsudin uh, is a dedicated professor with over 30 years of experience serving as a lecturer in agricultural economics he has a strong organizational and leadership abilities managing any academic entities at the faculty and university levels. A depth in developing curriculum in the fields of agriculture, agribusiness, and resource economics, and experience in conducting impactful research outputs. He is the member of the National Agricultural Advisory Council, Ministry of Agriculture of Food Industry. He is awarded a Tokoh Pekerja UPM uh, nine, uh, 2019. Uh, his academic experience is uh, teaching primarily in international agri agricultural trade, development economics and policy, environmental economics and managerial, managerial economics. His research areas include international agricultural trade policy, commodity market analysis, and agro-environmental and environmental economics. He has authored and co-authored more than 250 publications in book, uh, book chapters, journal articles and conference proceedings, supervised and co-supervised 60 PhDs and 30 master graduates. He is a researcher, researcher and consultant, economic planning unit under the Asian Development Bank, technical assistant, he is an advisor, agri flagship project, Ministry of Agriculture and Agrobase Industry, uh, member and consultative panel on agricultural productivity, Malaysian Productivity Corporation. Uh, his core competencies uh, is leadership, strategic planning, conceptual skills, technical skills, interpersonal skills, teaching, research and analysis, and economic analysis. Okay, uh, his educational background is HD in agricultural economics, Mississippi State University, and cum laude, uh, from Louisiana, Louisiana State University in 1980. Uh, that's uh, his um, background, yeah, academic background. And um, Professor Nasir, time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good morning. Can you all hear me very well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Siti Aziza Amir, Dr. Irfan, and all the students and all the lecturers. Once, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my appreciation for inviting me this year to deliver 
I would say to share, to share certain uh, experience uh, in the uh, area of agriculture economics and also agribusiness. Eh? And today's discussion so basically in on agribusiness project planning and management. Why I come up with this topic is that after this discussion, basically brief discussion through WhatsApp, basically with Dr. Siti Alidala, what would be the area that I want to give or deliver the discussion today? So basically, and then after a brief discussion, I come up with this topic, which is on project planning and, and management. But the lecture basically, so but the lecture basically is not a typical, it's not a typical lecture on agribusiness project planning and management, but rather on eye-opening giving ideas what are basically the agribusiness opportunities and also the importance of project planning eh? by giving certain examples of the agro-entrepreneurship development in UPM. Eh? The reason why I approach this angle is that yeah. I'm sure all the students, I was informed by Dr. Sitaliza, the students are in uh, management class and also doing agribusiness projects. So I believe the student have already exposed on the theory of uh, project planning and management. So I will not going to repeat uh, the discussion on the theory of project planning and management, but rather giving examples of what should be uh, giving ideas of how to do the agribusiness project planning and management. Yeah? So at any time, if the line is not very good, so please let me know so that I can repeat the discussion. So of course, this is some of the, I would say, the drawback of having online discussion or online lecture. Sometimes the line is not perfect. But anyway, please let me know. Last, last actually last Wednesday, I was in, uh, in, in Gajah Mada, in Yogyakarta. Eh? And today I am in uh, Malang, Brabijaya. And next month I will be back to Yogyakarta, University uh, Negeri, University Pembangunan Negeri, uh, the, the, something like that. Veteran, University Bet Pembangunan Negeri Veteran, something like that. So this is being the positive part of having online. So we can go Indonesia, back to Malaysia, go to Indian skin, back to Malaysia. But uh, of course, I would one day, I hope I can go to Malang uh, physically. I've been to Malang back in 2016 once, eh? and very nice. The area is uh, basically the temperature, the climate is very, very good in Malang. Eh? So I think to be back in Malang would be a very good opportunity. So this is some of the, uh, the approach of my lecture. I to give some examples, some, I would say, practical experience that we have in UPM uh, in area related to agribusiness project management and planning. So this is examples of some of our students uh, having involved in the agribusiness project. Some are in crop production, some in uh, chicken production, and some also actually in agriculture production. Uh. So our program, our program basically started in 2012. Eh? So, so far, we have trained. Uh, so, so far, we have trained um, close to 334 participants. And the success rate was uh, 53%. And we created 178 new entrepreneurs from this project, from this program. Eh? So I consider 50% success rate is very successful. Because from my experience, developing entrepreneurs using all this project planning is not, it's not everybody can do it. Eh? Only certain people actually can become entrepreneurs. Eh? So for me, after training 334 participants, and we come up with 178 entrepreneurs, which is 53% only, I would say consider a, a very successful. Eh? 
So this is some of the contoh kejayaan, some of the success of our program. Eh? So this is the Create One Sarikat called Belima Agribusiness. And their sales per year is about 6 million uh, per year. Eh? 6 million ringgit is, well, I, I don't remember now what is 1 ringgit to rupiah. How much Dr. Sintanizah now? 1 ringgit is, last time when I was in Indonesia, it was 3,000. Maybe you Pak Ivan knows how much ringgit right now. You can multiply by three. So it's juta-juta. Uh, it's so yeah. numbers. Nah. So this is one of the uh, company that they have uh, created. Nah. And the other one is uh, Harry Ibrahim to go into price. Uh, they involve uh, livestock. So 6,000, 6 million multiplied by 3,000. Eh? So that's the amount of the sales. I'm talking about the sales. Eh? About the sales. And the other one is by Ibrahim Tego. This is on livestock, basically, on uh, cattle production and also some crop production. And their sale is 720,000 ringgit. Eh? So we have also the other participant uh, involved in, we call it Ayam Kampung. I don't know. In, in English, we call it here village chicken. Uh, I don't know. Somehow they call it village. Or sometimes they call it a free range crossbred village chicken. Still called village chicken. I, I am Kampung. Eh? And the sale is more than 500,000 ringgit. Eh? We have you know, another example by Chia Sun Feng. And of course, this involves a lot of this um, vegetable production. Eh? And the sale is more than 700,000 ringgit. Eh? And we have also another participant um, in Pahang uh, dealing a lot with chili, eh? project tanaman chili, and the sale is more than 700,000. And we have also another, this is just a few examples of Sarikat Atla Enterprise uh, dealing, dealing with our food uh, retailing, eh? or restaurant business, eh? and the sale is close to 500,000. You all might wonder why I give all these examples. <laughs> the reason why we give this example is because this is, I would say, some of the success from our training in agro entrepreneurship development, which very important tool that we use is project planning and management. So the focus in that program is project planning and management. So how do we do it? So the question here, uh, this is also another example, <laughs> I forget. Uh, this is also on chili production, which is uh, close to 500,000. And also on Tanakanikan, uh, or agriculture production, is more than 500,000 ringgit. So this is, this is some of the examples of the success. Of course, we have 178 of them, of them eh? but I just few examples. So the question is, how are we, how did we do it uh, in, in developing all these entrepreneurs? As I said, this, this project actually come out when I was the dean of the faculty and I was involved in the teaching of agribusiness project planning and management. So I think at that time, if we just teaching the theory, and the student will go nowhere, basically. So of course the student will graduate with the knowledge of uh, project planning and management, and they become the working in the private sector and also working in the public sector, you know? But then I think the role of the university now is not only producing human capital, it's not only producing human resource, which we are, can be uh, that, that can work in the private and also public sectors. But I think the role of the university has changed the paradigm. So basically now our role is to produce entrepreneurs. When I come up with this idea of producing entrepreneurs in, the, in my class of agribusiness project planning and management, so of course people ask me, they said, Nasir, you are not entrepreneurs. How can you want to develop entrepreneurs? Of course, I said, I do not know. I'm not entrepreneur. I'm a professor. But then, to work with other people. Uh, so this is the concept that I developed. Eh? So basically, 
had to work with the government sector, with the bank, with the Department of Agriculture, Pharma basically is the marketing authority, with the Ministry of Agriculture, with MARDI basically is the research institute. Eh? Terus kalau eh? misalnya di fakultas ya, di yes. fakultas itu ada dua. Can you hear me? I think uh, one participant forget to mute <laughs> the microphone. Uh, please, uh, please mute everybody so that, yeah. And also, more importantly also, I have to work with the industry. Okay? Basically, I'm giving the training modules. And the training modules basically are in agribusiness business project planning and management. And the industry are the one who help us in the mentoring program, okay? Of course, they are the one who, of course, we teach the student in terms of project planning and management, but the industry are the one who are basically review the business plan. Uh, you see? Because they, they know better. We professors or lecturers or academicians, we know the theory, but we do not know the practical experience. So only the people in the industry know the industrial experience. So what I did is that I asked all the participants to develop the, to develop the business plan and had to be reviewed. So I had to present this business plan to the industry people and also to the agrobank because the bank are the one who give the loan. So the industry people are the one who really say, yes, this project is viable. <laughs> so I think after we came working with, with the government sectors and also working with the industrial sector or the private sector, that's why I said we have had some success in this program. Okay? So this is the, so, so, so what I say is that in this program, uh, basically the main content is on project planning and management. In fact, actually, the course project planning management, I think is very, very important. I remember when I was uh, in Malaysia, they call it Deputy West Chancellor. In, uh, in, in Indonesia, I think they call it Wakil Rector. You call Rector, Wakil Rector. When I was a Wakil Rector, I make sure most of the courses in the university have the component of project planning and management. Because in reality, whether we like it or not, in real life, we have to make decisions. And this decision basically are uh, talking whether certain project, certain activities is feasible or not. So the feasibility of certain project is based on our knowledge of project planning and management. So that's why most of the program in UPM they have a course called Project Planning and Management. Of course, they don't call it agribusiness. I mean, only those in Faculty of Agriculture they have agribusiness. But those in food science, those in engineering, they have project planning and management. Because I think it is very, very important, I would say knowledge, very, very important skill in, in life later after they graduate to make a better decision whether the decision is viable or not, okay? So this is, of course, the area of agribusiness. Eh? Of course, it started from, start from the uh, input services and until the consumer satisfaction. So we have the modules in crops, agriculture, livestock, food services, and also in terms of marketing and logistics. So these are the whole the program. No. So the first thing that we want to expose to the students, or sometimes we call it participants, is how we come up with the business ideas. Uh, turning a business issue into opportunities. So as I said just now, the angle of my lecture is not really on the theory of project planning, but, but more of the importance of project planning and management. So the first thing that we ask the students is to discuss the issues in agribusiness and how we want to translate those issues 
into business ideas and opportunities. So it's very, very important. So normally we have one or two classes to brainstorm with the student. So all are the issues. And how can we make this issue into a business? For example, now in COVID-19, in Malaysia, we are also working from home. And I believe in Indonesia also, you all are working from home. Now I think things are a little bit okay now, but we used to be, we don't come out from the house. So what are our, so these are basically the issues. And somehow digital business, digital marketing now become very, very important. So these are what we say is try to translate the issues into, into opportunities. So these are some of the issues. So normally I will ask students to discuss all these issues and how can we translate all these issues in terms of mega trend turning into opportunities. Mega trend shaping, shaping agribusiness landscape and how can we turn into opportunities. <laughs> For example, <clears throat> our population has, uh, has been increasing. Of course, the data I checked in Indonesia, by 2040, the population of Indonesia is more than 300 million. In Malaysia, about 40 million. Of course, our country, Malaysia, is much, much smaller than Indonesia. Yeah? So, so what, are the, what are the business that can be developed what are the ideas, business opportunities that can be recouped, that can be obtained from feeding increasing population? So, not only the issue also now is not only increasing population, but with per capita income growth. People also have been shifting their diets as a food consumption patterns. So these two actually, there are a lot of business opportunities. So what I did, what we did in UPM is that from each one of this issue, the student have to come up with what are the possible business that they can obtain or they can uh, formulate, formulate from all these ideas. Eh? So the students then have to conduct business plan, business planning and, and management. Yeah? Certainly, talking about increasing population, of course, more mouths to be fed. So we need more food production. We need more import of food. Importing food also is a business by itself. And growing more foods also is a business by itself. But then with income growth, somehow, it's not only the quantity of the food, but also in terms of quality. So my studies basically now um, used to be when I estimate the demand function is in terms of quantity. But now the demand function is in terms of quality. So meaning that the demand for certain food product is talking about the attributes of the food rather than the quantity of the food. So all this income grows, the diet has been shifting, like in Malaysia, for example, and I believe also in Indonesia, the per capita consumption of fruits has been increasing, the per capita consumption of vegetables also has been increasing, the per capita consumption of red meat also has been increasing. But, the per capita consumption of rice has been declining over the years. So not only that, the concern for food safety also has been improving over the years. The knowledge of food safety, the, the demand for food safety also has been increasing. So else also all this basically, there are a lot of business opportunities, business ideas. Of course, the next will be urbanization. We are not talking only urbanization, but we are talking now about accelerating urbanization. Why is it related to agriculture? Because urban people normally don't grow food. 
normally a burn area, a burn dwellers are the net buyers of food. So this is where a burn farming is very, very important. In order to have a burn farming, then of course there are a lot of, I would say, the tools that can be used for urban farming. So this also a lot of business opportunity. A new gadget, a new tools that can be used for urban farming. Uh, because, uh, so this is a lot of business opportunity. We're talking about climate change resource, uh, we're talking about technological breakthrough, digitalization, of course, eh? uh, techno, uh, discipline system, and of course, COVID-19. So all these are basically from each topic, as I said just now, from each topic, the students have to brainstorm, have to discuss among them and come up with one business plan. Uh -huh. Of course, as I said, business plan is feasible only if we talk to the industry. So at least we as a lecturer, we can more or less guide the students in terms of the business plan, in terms of feasibility, the net present value, in terms of internal rate of return and so forth, some of the criteria. But of course, we have also to present to the industry, people in the industry. So whether the project is feasible or not. Eh? So this is basically the way we come up with idea of project planning management, idea with the business plan, is by looking, by discussing, or having discussion on the issues in agribusiness. And how can we turn these issues into uh, business opportunities? Okay. These are some also, some of the issues. I hope my internet is still clear, yeah? Uh, Ibu Tavira, is, can you hear me very well? Is everybody can hear me very well? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Siti, okay? Clear? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Clear. Okay, good. So these are some of the uh, okay, good. Some of the technology that can be also can be translated into business. Okay, good, thank you. And of course now, talking about larger farm, talking about control environment, robotic sensors. So there are a lot of business opportunities in robotics actually, and also in sensors. Eh? Uh, biotechnology, high-tech machinery, precision farming. Eh? So these are some of the, I would say, all the new, all the technology, smart farming technology that we in agribusiness can turn this into a business ideas and also turn into business plan. Right? So then of course, after the discussion, after looking at the issues, then we ask all the students basically to present their business ideas based on the issues and so based on the mega trend in business. Eh? So it's very, very interesting actually, eh? when looking at the student, you know, I, I, uh, so I was informed by Dr. Siti Azia also that students are now, they are having a business project. Eh? So it's very interesting. So normally the student have to present to the lecturer first. And then of course, to know whether, as I said, whether the project is feasible or not, then we have to invite the people from the industry to listen and to decide whether the project is feasible or not. Eh? So this is so I think it's very good. Eh? So I think, uh, is there any student who want to give a response on these some business ideas from all these uh, issues, mega trend? Anybody? Briefly, probably you can come up with business ideas. Anyone? You, you already have a plan or a business project in your class. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can. Uh, share with uh, Prof. Nasir? Yeah, about five minutes or so, so that it's more lively, the discussion, rather than one way. 
Anybody, any student who want to uh, give some ideas, yeah. business okay? ideas, for issues that mm -hmm. I present? Is it okay if they speak in Indonesia? In Bahasa? Oh, God, no problem. We have yeah. close to 200 participants, actually. 197 <laughs> participants. Can speak Indonesia, okay, but speak English will be better. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> so that we can train. <laughs> Okay. We ask the student to speak English, actually. Yes, uh, may, I think uh, some of the students can speak English. Anybody English. can speak okay. English? Yes, yes uh, talk, yeah. share your uh, ideas. And Prof. Nasir yeah, will, yeah, uh, sure. yeah, sure. will uh, contribute. Maybe um, Prof. Nasir can contribute some of the ideas for, for your project. Okay, some of you? Uh, excuse me, Miss. Can I? Can I? Uh, yes, Novika. Yeah. Yes, hello. My name is Novika. Uh, I'm from sci uh, Animal Science uh, University of Brawijaya. So in my class is there is a project, a small project uh, in my group uh, that call I Beta, or it's about uh, beta fish. In this uh, pandemic, uh, COVID nineteen, uh, many uh, people. Uh, uh, have a little time or some time that make them feel bored in home because this pandemic must be so hard. Uh, every I'm people, well, would, yeah, yeah. Every people want to spend their time in some hobbies or thing that they uh they would like so. I think uh, we have some project, a mini project that make a small business about beta fish. Uh, it's about uh, ikan hias. Uh, it's a little bit viral in Indonesian uh. about this fish. So uh. I think if we uh, do some business about this beta fish is some uh, opportunity yang bisa kita lakukan when a pandemic uh, sedang berlangsung. Jadi mungkin, sorry if I speak Indonesian. So mungkin dengan adanya yeah, yeah, okay. di sini, uh, kita bisa meningkatkan apa namanya kemampuan kita untuk berbisnis dengan melihat sektor-sektor uh, small business ini semakin apa ya uh, terlihat jadi menggunakan keviralan atau yang sedang trending ini sebag sebagai bisnis itu mungkin bisa apa ya bisa menjadi ide untuk uh, di masa pandemik ini terima kasih ya yeah, I, I don't hear very well but what I can hear is that you are basically one have a business plan on uh, recreational fish, they call it, eh? Yeah. Recreational fish. Uh, not fish. Not fish for food, but fish for, for no, recreation. No. Yeah? Yeah. So this is, I uh, think, a good business idea. Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, my experience, I don't have my experience in Indonesia, but my experience in Malaysia, as our income increase, the demand for all this uh, kind of good also tend to increase. Yeah? Because in economic development, as our income increase, the demand for necessity also increase. But beyond necessity, necessity mean like food, shelter, yeah? but once income increase further, so the demand for all this type of good and services also tend to increase. So I think it's a, a good business idea. But then in my lecture later, of course, we have, look at the, we have to look at the competitors and things like that. Eh? And then of course, we have to cash flow analysis where the project is uh, uh, feasible or not in terms of internal rate of return, in terms of net present value, in terms of all this. Eh? Which, which I think the lecturer, your lecturer, have, 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 have uh, delivered all this, all this uh, daily. Eh? So I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea in terms of that kind of uh, uh, recreational vision. Ini belikan dalam 
dalam dalam untuk tujuan uh, what you call uh, accretion rather than uh, for food consumption. Eh? That is a good business. Thank you. No, Novika, Novika Mayang Chak. Eh? So, yes, thank you. Yeah, this is also basically um, the issues is that as our income increase, uh, the demand for good and services beyond necessity also tend to increase. Eh? And also, in theory also, in environmental economics, uh, as our income increases, the demand for environmental quality also increases. So there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of environmental issues in agriculture, and how can we uh, come up with the business ideas dealing with environmental issues? Yeah? Uh, so there are a lot, actually, uh, some business that you can do uh, that we, you can, we can formulate based on environmental issues. Eh? So this is also, I think, is some, a lot of business ideas. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you. Novika, yeah? Novika, apa, belajar apa ya? Yeah? Program? Uh, animal science, peternakan. Animal science. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. So, other than that, of course, one, we have to come out with uh, some business ideas, so some business plan. Of course, we have to realize the business ideas. How? Oh, it is by number one, of course, any business must create value. Okay? Like this lecture also, of course, must have value. If there is no value, then of course, there is no point of having lecture today. <laughs> so everything must have value, must create value. Of course, first, like Novika, you have to choose the value. Choose value to macam mana? And who are your customer? You have to think about it. And who are the market segmentation? And of course, you have to value proposing, uh, value positioning. Eh? Value positioning means what type of fish that you tend to rent, eh? and basically the pricing and so forth. Eh? So that's why, first of course, having like Novika business just now, rearing reaction of fish, is basically you have chosen certain value. Value in terms of what? Because anything activities must create value. That means you choose the value, the value of having that business plan. Eh? And, but the thing is, you have to know who are your customers, who are, where is the market, and also what kind of fish that you want to rent in terms of reaction of fish. That's called choosing value. But when you choose the value, but choosing value to Novika. Choosing the value means you choose that kind of business. And of course, you have to provide the value, meaning that you have to develop the product, you have to know what is the price of your product, and how you how, how you want to distribute your product and so forth. Eh? So that is called providing the value to the customer, the potential customer. Then, of course, you have also to communicate, you have to tell people, you have to have this business by advertising, by sale promotion, things like that. Eh? So meaning that choosing the value, after you choose the value, you have to provide the value. Provide the value mean what are the product development, meaning that what type of fish, how you want to market, how you want to package your, your, your business, eh? and how much is the price. And service development mean how you want to do the service to the customer. Okay, but now for example, with the pandemic, of course, what we do is the house to house. Basically, you just deliver to the door. Um, because online marketing become more and more important. That's cause to this development. People can just go to the apps and go to your company. They want to buy this how many fish, whatever. Yeah? And then you just deliver online to their houses. We call service de development. Of course, pricing you have to you have to benchmark with other competitors. I'm sure in your area, there has been several this kind of business. Eh? So I have to check with them, how much they are pricing, how do they deliver value, how they, want they, how they develop the product, and so, so that your product is better than, than your competitor. Eh? It's no point you are selling the same thing. That means 
your product is the same as others. You must be able to differentiate your product. Must be able to differentiate your services. Eh? So this, by having this, then of course, then people will tend to recognize and to know that your service, your product, your pricing is better than your competitor. Eh? This is the theory, lah. The theory, but of course. In order to be realized, then you have to talk to people in industry. You know? <laughs> we are lecturer, we know the theory, but you have also to talk to the people in the industry whether your project is really feasible or not. Yeah? Then, of course, uh, you have to communicate the value, meaning that you have to advertise, you have to promote. Now, I think advertising promotion is very, very easy. But having the WhatsApp, you can just you just broadcast to, to all your colleagues, then is that basically. Yeah? So communicating the value currently with all this gadget, with all this uh, technology, now is very cheap actually. Yeah? You can just put in the group of WhatsApp, then they will just barrel one, one group to another, one group to another, then of course there you are. You can basically communicate the value. Yeah? So Novika, you are basically at the process choosing the value, Next stage will be providing the value, and the next stage will be you have to communicate the value. So this is some of the some of the uh, value positioning, market segmentation in terms of using the value, in terms of providing the value, in terms of product development, yeah? uh, where do you get the input, service development in terms of the distribution. Yeah? Now of course, <coughs> okay, online business is becoming more and more important. And of course, communicating the value, communicating the value in terms of promotion, in terms of advertisement, and so forth. Eh? Of course, once we have the business ideas, then you have to do the market research. That's eh? not no, we also have to do market research. Market research means to do with potential, what are the potential demand, who are your competitor, I'm sure. Eh? Potential demand meaning that who will be, who want to buy your product and what kind of people who want to buy the product. Because recreational fish basically are not demanded by lower income group. So your target will be higher income people. Okay? So it's no point basically the focus on lower income. So those who have certain level of income that will purchase this kind of, that will demand this kind of, of, of good. Eh? And of course, then of course, you have to conduct the competitor analysis. Who are your competitors? And the four P's, I'm sure you have learned four P's again, Anubika. The pricing, the product, the people, the place and so on. And of course, you have to do certain SWOT analysis. Eh? So, so in this case, the, the market research is the process of collecting, analyzing, interpreting data about your target market, your consumers, your competitors, and the industry as a whole. You must know that. Eh? And of course, the businessman must have, you know, talking about the computer analysis, the financial planning, the SWOT analysis, the marketing plan, things like that. Eh? So this is uh, which I think, which I believe you have learned this. But anyway, I just <laughs> I throw back eh, the the importance of this kind of market research. Eh? So when you choose the value, then of course first I just repeat back my lecture. Of course, from the issues translated to business ideas, but of course from the business ideas we have to come up with the market research, eh? what are the potential demand, who are your competitor, the four pieces that you, I'm sure you have learned in your class and conduct the SWOT analysis. Eh? So these are some of the market research, eh? the process of determining the viability of a new service or product through research conducted directly with potential customer. Eh? So top 10 market research benefit for startup. Startup means a new business. Of course, we, we can know the, the industry outlook, eh? 
the market size, the market trend, the competitor, buyer personality, eh? buyer who are who are who are the potential buyers basically, the market segment, eh? the target segment, competitor market share, product pricing, and product marketing. So these are the thing that you can get from the market research. So Novika and all students, before we conduct the business, you have to conduct the, the market research, eh? which is, I believe, is very, very important. Eh? So these are some of the benefits eh, of the market research. So anybody who has question, please, uh, please uh, ask me. Eh? Please ask me the question. Eh? Let me look some chat whether there is any question or not. Uh, there are two questions actually, Prof. Nasir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will read for you. The first question is from uh, uh, the second question from Detri. Excuse me, I have a question. Uh, if I want to start uh, a agri business, is it enough with money and knowledge or not? Is it enough? Only with the money and knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Uh, cukup hanya dengan okay, uh, dan... very good question. Me. Let, let... Yes, yes. I can understand it. I think very, very good question. Uh, very good question. Huh? Uh, that if, uh, from... Uh, that three? That three. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That three. From that. As I said just now, we are uh, myself, Dr. Irfan, Dr. Siti Aziza. We are lecturers. We we don't have any we don't have any uh, business experience, but we can guide you. Okay, now, from my experience, as I said just now, the success of our program, uh, developing or producing entrepreneurs is by working together with industry and also with the government servant. Okay. But then, from my experience, very important to conduct a business, to start agribusiness, is by having ideas. Not money. Ideas is more important than money. Having money, no ideas, will go nowhere. Do you... Do, you, we, we do, do we notice or not? The owner of the Grab, you know, Grab, Grab used to be car, now become Grab for food and everything. But the owner of the Grab has a class actually. The Grab, you know, initially, the owner of the Grab, the Grab business, the owner, they have no class. He has only business. Huh? He has only the business ideas. And then, of course, they develop the apps, the system, and, of course, he become millionaire. If we look at Bill Gates, for example, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, I think, first, he come out with the ideas. The idea is very important. And also, the, for example, the Facebook, the owner of Facebook. All these people are actually, they have the business ideas. So ideas is very, very important to start a business. If your ideas is very good, and you talk to the industry, there are a lot of people who want to invest in your business. Remember that, eh? so then three, if you want to start business, money is number two. Number one is your business ideas is very important. Why? If you look at the success of new business, but we better to have a new business, new business ideas. Like Grab business, it's new business ideas. Like Microsoft, then back in 19, uh, in 1980s, we didn't, uh, I mean, we didn't hear any Microsoft then. I remember when I did my PhD, I used this call Word Perfect and this one. Uh, they don't have words, they have around this. So Bill Gates come out with the ideas. Huh? And also Facebook. I don't remember the owner of Facebook, they come out with the ideas. Eh? So why they come out with the ideas? It's because 
they, they, they realize certain issues. They analyze the issues. Mm -hmm. Like grabs, of course, they analyze the issues. Like uh, Microsoft, they know that one day the people, because, you know, to type a product, to make a good presentation, everything. That's why Microsoft come up with the, with the, with Microsoft, Bill Gates come up with the Microsoft. So the thing is to start a good business, as I said just now, analyze the issues and come up with the business ideas and present your business plan to the, to the industry people. And if the project is feasible, mind you, there are a lot of people who want to invest in your project, sharing the money. Huh? So money, number two, and number one is business. So that I hope that answer your question. Where is the second question? Yeah, uh, the second questions before a uh, participant who raised hands from uh, Francisco Sitohang. Excuse me, permission to ask how to have a business uh, during a pandemic. How can can I, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, not, not how, clear. To, how to have a business to have a business during pandemic like uh, Corona? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Good, huh? Of course, now it's a really difficult time. A lot of people are losing the jobs. A lot of people are losing incomes. A lot of middle income people become low income people. That's happening in Malaysia now. So it's very sad time uh, what's happening. But remember, when there are issues, when there are problems, there are opportunities. Remember that, eh? When there are problems, there are opportunities. During this pandemic, there are a lot of new business has been created actually. Why? How? By using digital platform. So I can see a lot of people who lose the job, they have the business now. For example, I have a friend, for example, because he lost his job, he cooked from his home, the sambal, you know sambal? Uh, I don't know why it's English called sambal. Sambal, yeah. sambal, kan? Sambal, yeah. <laughs> sambal. Now he has a sambal business, basically. Because he's lost the job, and then both of them, husband and wife, lost the job, they don't know what to do. Then of course, they some point the wife know how to cook very well. Now they have online, basically, physical delivery and online delivery of this sambal, basically. Okay? So because they know why, because people basically do not really go out. People are scared to go out. So digital business become very important. So they, they pack the sambal in plastic and also they bottle it at home and they promote. Of course, they can communicate the value. Choosing the sambal is actually choosing the value. Lah. And then they, 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 they communicate the value to us as the friend, everything. So they either using, you can buy the sambal, of course they can send using the traps, or of course they can deliver from your house. So this is also uh, some business ideas during this pandemic. So remember, when there is a problem, there is a business idea. And there is one more that I know, that I buy also sometime, they call it the, you know, in Indonesia, whether they have laksa or not, laksa. Mi rebus dengan laksa, eh? Mi rebus dengan laksa. So, a lot of people losing the job. So what they do is that they are they are they're, they're selling this mi rebus and also laksa and home delivery. So they now communicating the value. Advertisement is very 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 simple. They just put the advertisement in the WhatsApp group and then they virally, and then people will. Uh, Order, they will online their purchase the money, yeah, deposit in this account, and yet the the mirror boss will come to your house. 
and the business is spending now. It's spending now. Yeah? So sometime in the morning also, sometimes I just WhatsApp that people, I want two Mirabos for me and my wife. Eh? And then, of course, I will deposit in this account and then Mirabos will come from 12 to 1. Okay? So these are some of the business ideas, eh? business that can be conducted during pandemic. Look at the issues, basically. The issues is that during the pandemic, there are a lot of people who lose the jobs. And then one more thing is that there are a lot of people, basically, they don't get up from the house because in Malaysia, we have MCO, movement control order. We have, we cannot cross border now, basically. I'm staying in Selangor, I cannot go to other state now. And still now, I have to have a police permission. And also, I only recently, last week, that we can dine in, in restaurant. It's to be we can only uh, buy and bring home to eat. So, but the thing is, so there are so many people who scared to get out. So home delivery of food are becoming, I would say, the trend of the day. So these are a few examples, basically, of business from the problem that has been created. And now I think those people selling sambal, man, I think his income is much better, is higher when he worked last time before the pandemic. Of course, he was very sad, uh, but uh, he, he lost the job. But now I'm very happy. Selling sambal only. Eh? Selling sambal eh? to, to the friend. Yeah, just to the friend, actually. To, I mean, to UPM friend. There are, there are about 3,000 people working in UPM. Just, just 3,000 people. I think, I, think, I think his income is much more. Eh? I, I asked him. His income is much more compact when he got a job last time. Eh? So that, that's basically eh? So the thing is, whatever, uh, back to question number one just now, business ideas is very, very important. But then, of course, we are not in business people. Talk to the people industry whether the project is feasible or not. While during pandemic, look at the issues and look at the technology that we have now. Eh? All this technology basically can help us doing the business. Eh? So any problem, any issues, people say there is opportunity. Eh? So look at the issues and come up with that. Business ideas and opportunity. Selling sambal also, I think, is a, is a good business uh, business ideas. I think you start from small. And, and, and of course, these are the things. Yeah. So with that, uh, I think I hope I can answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Next. Yeah. We, we have uh, three students who raise hand. The first is Altofif, Altofian Arya. Altofian, are you here? Yes. Yeah, yeah you can. Uh, Ask the question. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for the recognition. I'm Alta Fianaria Putra from Brawijaya okay. University, Animal Science degree. So I want to ask about when we start business, I heard from someone that I know, when we start business, it's like a gambling, they said, because it really depends on the situation around and also the luck factor. So what do you think about that statement, which is when we start business is like a gambling and also how we maintain our business so, you very well. uh, so it could stay. Altofian, can you repeat your question? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So actually I heard from someone a statement that called when we start a business, it's like a gambling because it really depends on the situation and also the luck factor. What do you think about that statement? And also how we maintain, when we start business, how we maintain our business so it could stay safe during everything that could happen like pandemic or maybe like economic issue within the countries or maybe the, you know, our situation around there. I, I don't hear your question actually. Oh, really? Yeah, because there's something wrong with the line. Can you repeat briefly? Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to repeat it very briefly. So, um, what do you think about a statement that are saying when we start a business, it's like a gambling because it really depends on the situation around and also the lucky factors of the person who want to start the business? Like gambling, yeah? Yes, because it's really depends yeah, on the situation. I can. 
Uh, I don't hear very well, but this is what I can catch. Uh, if if probably Dr. Siti Aziza can explain to me. Uh, the question is, starting a business is like gambling, is it? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> This is what we are discussing today, project planning and management. Yes. <laughs> of course, as a business, you have to have a good project planning and management. Eh? Of course, entrepreneurs normally are risk takers. Uh, I mean, we have to accept that. There are a lot of risks in business. We have to accept that. We have to accept that. Risk. But in theory, I'm sure those who are uh, who have taken a course in finance, they have what we call EV frontier. You have learned that EV frontier. EV frontier basically high return, high risk, <laughs> low return, low risk. So normally business, of course, what Prophet said also, nine out of ten risky is from business. But remember. Business come with risk. I mean, we have to accept that. It's, we don't call that gambling. We call it risk. And normally, entrepreneurs are risk takers. But, uh, let me say, but there are ways to minimize the risk. The risk is everywhere, actually. In life, there is a risk. But we have to minimize the risk. How? by proper project planning and management. What project planning management mean <coughs> with a proper market research, with proper cash flow analysis, with proper discussion with the industry people, then I believe we can minimize the risk. The important thing is we minimize the risk. I don't think we can have zero risk. Anything we do, there will be a risk, but we try to minimize the risk. I hope that answers your question. Eh? But does Isa, that answer the question or not? Because I don't really hear the question just now. Yeah. Alto, uh, how about the answer? Oh, yes, the answer is really yeah, answering my question about. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, we, we, uh, what we can do is to minimize the risk. Huh? Okay. Oh, there yeah. are risk. Anything, anything we do is like minimize the risk by doing the what our discussion today, project planning and management. But we all know what is project planning and management. Project planning and management means we have to do the market research, we have to do the financial analysis, we have to talk to the people, everything. Who are our competitor? Who are what are our market size, market trend, all those? And this is what the market research. What the industry outlook also we have to know. Yeah? It's no point doing the industry that there is no good future outlook. The industry must be expanding things like that. Then inshallah. Huh? But yes. like some research just now, it is necessity. People every I mean, eating sambal is something that. We, we must have to have. <laughs> so, so, so the market size is still there. I mean, that's a good example. But the thing is, uh, I said to answer that question, we have to do a proper project planning and management. Right? Then of course we yes, can. That's uh, what we want to talk here. Yeah. Let me continue Bye, uh, and this... then I will open for other questions. Eh? Okay. Okay. So these are some of the, how are we doing the industry outlook? Uh, yeah? Because one of the market research just now is to do the industry outlook. So these are some of the, the ways to conduct the scenario analysis by doing the past analysis and so SWOT, SWOT analysis factors. Eh? I'm sure you have learned this. So past analysis basically looking at the social, the technological, the economics, the political, and so forth. They call it S. And of SWOT, of course, I'm sure you know why SWOT. SWOT is looking at the, the strength of the, your business, the weaknesses, the opportunities, of course, the threat. Eh? So these are, we have to conduct all these variables. Huh? Um, these are some of the, <coughs> I'm sure you have learned this, eh? some of the SWOT metrics. Eh? 
uh, the strength and opportunities, for example, they call, they call it SO strategies, eh? generate strategies that use strength to take advantage of the external opportunities. These are, these are some examples. <laughs> I, I, uh, yesterday, I give this to Dr. Siti Aziza, my PowerPoint, and Dr. Siti Aziza, can, you can share with your student if you want. Eh? <coughs> yeah, we already shared the PowerPoint, yeah, the link of yeah, the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah they're good, good. Yeah. So, this also some of the uh, feasibility, yeah? some of the feasibility. Uh, of course, the business plan. That's one of the question. I think it's very, very good. Uh, how can we minimize the risk is looking at the feasibility. Yeah? Uh, it's an empirical instrument during the project design phase. That means when you are still come up with the ideas and everything, <coughs> that demonstrate how the company will function under a certain set of assumptions. Yeah? <coughs> of course, the feasibility, we're looking at the financial feasible uh, study, cash flow analysis, I'm sure you have learned, eh? internet of return, the net present value, the product feasibility, the market feasibility, the organizational feasibility. Eh? So when we talk about feasibility, it's not only about the financial feasibility. So you have to look also at the product feasibility, the market feasibility, and also very, very important also, if your company feasibility, eh? So these are the four components of feasibility that we have to conduct during the, during the project design. What is the project design? During the come up with the business plan. Eh? So what is your product? Is your product basically and to deteriorate? Or the, why the, your product? Because I'm, I'm sure you learned in marketing, that is what we call, you know, uh, the product will decay after some time, isn't it? Huh? So, so, you, so is, is your product still have a lot of improvement over the years? So it's no point doing business where the product is decaying, for example. Eh? So things like that. Eh? So of course, these are also some example eh, of the uh, business venture. Eh? You have to spend some time with the resources necessary to move forward, the business ideas. Eh? And then, of course, I said just now, look at the product feasibility, the market feasibility. Yes, in all four areas, then, of course, you can proceed with the business. No, in one or more, drop or rethink of the business ideas. Huh? So these are some of the, I would say, <clears throat> some of the guides huh? during the project design. Huh? When you have the business ideas, you have to look at all this feasibility. Huh? looking at the product feasibility, things like that. If all the feasibility are yes, I mean feasible, looking at the financial cash flow analysis, yes, they are feasible. Looking at the product, yes, for example, they are feasible. Looking at the, your organization, yes, they are feasible, for example. If all the feasible, then of course, you can proceed with the business plan, okay? But the question is, how to know whether they are feasible? Of course, very, very important is to talk with the people with the industry. It's very, very important to do the, the conduct market research. Eh? Then if, if no in one or more areas, I think if all of them are no, for example, I'm <coughs> sure so you, have, you have to drop, lah, drop the business ideas. Eh? Probably they are not feasible at all. But if one or two are not feasible, of course, we have to think and whether they are feasible. When these four are feasible, then I think back to one of the student questions is very important just now, is we can minimize the risk. <laughs> when minimize the risk, of course, then you can proceed with the, with the business idea. Huh? So this is basically, uh, but of course, we are not ending our lecture yet. Eh? We uh, come up with, uh, I will invite a few questions, but I will take opportunities for you who want to study in UPM later. I'm doing some promotion. Nah. In business, we call it communicating the value now. Uh, this is some of the UPM. Eh? We love UPM. These are some of the entrance to UPM and everything. 
these are some of our farm and these some of uh, you know uh, we have we have also uh, you know a queen park and everything we have of course before the pandemic we have about 4000 international students eh? so of course now of course now it's much less because of the pandemic eh? so anyway uh, this is a brief uh, uh, for those who have not come to upm uh, please do come eh? I have been to Malang, to, to, to Bravijaya in 2016, of course. Uh, hope I can go there again. Eh? And the temperature is very, very good. Eh? Uh, I think we visited some of the apple, apple farm, I think. Apple, I think, remember. Eh? Yes, it's yeah. apple farm, Batu. Apple yeah. farm. I think it's a very, I think very nice place to stay compared to Kuala Lumpur. Where I stay. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, there's jump But anyway, now, uh, basically, as far as lecture concerned, uh, already done with the lecture. But I think now it's time for us to have some discussion. Eh? So if there is any question, then of course, not necessarily that I can answer the question, but I think I also welcome uh, input from other students and input from Dr. Siti and input from uh, Dr. Ifan and all other lecturers. Let's discuss about it. Eh? Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, uh yeah, we have uh, two raised hands and many questions, actually, yeah. Uh, I will go to uh, Afif Hoyroni, yeah. Afif? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Master Ceremony of City Aziza Amir. Uh, I want to add for answer short, Nasir Samsudin. Uh, I want question for you. What do you think now, problem business and solution? And then number two question, what do you think? How can a country be called a developed country? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, what, I can hear very well your, your second question, but what is the first question just now? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, question number two, what do you think? How can a country be called a developed country? The question number one. Yeah. The second question is the characteristics of developed country, developed oh. country. And the first one is the first question yes. is yes, it is. The first one. Uh I want question for you. What do you know? Business problem and solution. Problems and business problems and solutions. Yes, yes, yeah. right. Uh, what kind of business problems and solutions? Problem and yeah. oh, It's very very tough question. <laughs> very very tough question. I'm not sure I can I can I can uh, address that question. I think question number one is what are the business problems and what are the solutions. Second, uh, what are the characteristics of characteristic of developed countries? Developed countries. Back to question number one. Uh, what are the business problem and solution? Yeah? As I said. We are not business people here, but I have a lot of business friends. Yeah? And of course, when we develop all this uh, producing entrepreneur, we have to work together with the industry. Yeah? They, are, they, are, they are the ones who lose the people. But based on my experience, talking with my industry people, talking with the business people, yeah? my friend and business people, when they come up with the problem, of course, the first thing actually, they are looking at the marketing. Marketing, market, market assessment. Because as a business, normally the survival of the business based on the demand of the products. If the product, if the demand is improving, the business is, I would say, mushrooming. If the demand is dwindling, of course, the, I would say, the business also is declining. First, normally they look at the, what are the problem with the marketing? Okay? So this is where they try to fix the marketing problem, the demand, so that they have to stabilize the demand. Demand 
is very, very important. Eh? So this is basically the low and demand. Next, they looks at the production problem. Okay, if the demand is there, and yet the business the business is not improving, then they have to know why the production <clears throat> is not achieving, is not fulfilling the demand. Okay, is it due to the problem in the production? problem human resource, the problem of not using proper technology and so forth. And thirdly, very, very important also is to look at your competitor, okay? Competitor, because in any business, there are competitor. Is your competitor providing better values in terms of the prices, in terms of product packaging, in terms of the product development, so much so the demand has shifted from your, from your sales to other firms. So these are basically the thing, three things that, you know, when they have problem and how they try to solve the problem. First, just repeat, looking at the marketing. What happened to the sales of your products? Is the sales increasing? Is the sales declining? And so, and what is the problem? Second, looking at the production, the production of your products. Yeah? Uh, when the production, of course, there are a lot of factors that affect in production, especially the people. Actually, in business, when you talk to business, the main asset actually is the people, the people, the workers. There, it's very very important. Yeah? So next is looking at the, of course, the competitor of your. So these are certain scenarios. I mean, after talking to the people, eh, uh, what are normally their yeah. problems? Back to second question, talking about characteristics of developed countries. But this question is a bit way off from our topic. Anyway, anyway. anyway. So of course, uh, there are a lot of index actually. Eh? Human Development Index, HDI, yeah, which is one of the criteria that a country is called developed. And of course, number one, they look at the per capita income. Not income, not total income, per capita income. Of course, Indonesia is very, very, I would say, much, much larger country than Malaysia. Of course, total income of Indonesia is very, very big, very huge. And total income of Malaysia is very, very small because we are only 30 million. And Indonesia is, no, 250 million people. <clears throat> but they look at per capita, per person income. So this is the main characteristic that can be used by the United Nations and everything. So whether that country is developed or not, is looking at the number one, per capita income. Second, looking at SDI, Human Development Index. This is talking about the welfare of the people, the education level, the health status and everything, the welfare. And of course now, of course there are, now, there are a lot of other characters now looking at the SDG. Eh? I'm sure you sustainable development goals, whether each country can fulfill some of the SDGs, like food security, talking about the health status, talking about gender issues, all these, whether we can fulfill. If we can fulfill all those, then we are moving toward developed countries. But I said just now, very important one, still income, per capita income. If per capita income is high, then that country is developed country. So if the per capita income is still low, then of course that country is, I would say, developing countries. Like us, we, Malaysia, Indonesia is what I call developing countries. We are not developed yet. We are developing countries. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Eh? Thank you very much. Uh, Prof Nasser, uh, before we go to the two uh, direct questions, we have a written questions also. 
I uh, I will uh, read it for you. The first question is from uh, Pak Amam from uh, Jember University. Uh, he asked, in the context of agribusiness project planning and management, we cannot ignore the risk of the agricultural system. What are the risks in the upstream sector on farm and the downstream sector of the agricultural system in Malaysia? And uh, what is the role of government, academics, and industry? Okay, let me answer this question. Ini from Jember ya, Pak? Yes. Nah, saya dengan Jember, banyak kali uh, di Jember ya. Uh, uh, banyak rakan-rakan di sana. In fact, in fact uh, Jember and UPM, we have a lot of, uh, we have MOU and we have several uh, 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 activities together with the Jember Institute. Nice, uh, nice to have uh, someone from Jember to ask the question. Eh? So the question is basically, of course, we cannot ignore the risk of agriculture system. The risk is there. In any kind of activities, especially in business, the risk is there. Uh, we have we have to we have we have to accept that. That's why people say entrepreneurs are risk lovers. They love risk. <laughs> but we basically uh, professors, lecturer are risk adverse. <laughs> we don't like risk. But the question is. As, as one of the questions by students just now, how can we minimize the risk? By doing the proper project planning and management. No. And then, the question, what are the risks in up, upstream sector? In Malaysia, I think not only in Malaysia, in many parts of the world, the risk in upstream sector is talking about Price variability. This is very, very important. Price variability. Number one, because farm products, the price of farm product tend to fluctuate. And not only in Malaysia, not only in Indonesia, it's everywhere in the world. But now, for example, the price of palm oil is very high. All the farmers are very happy now. But remember in 2019, the price was very, very low. Most of the farmers are crying. So, price fluctuation is one of the, I would say, one of the existent, perennial, so to speak, problem in upstream business. That's number one. Number, but the thing is, there are a lot of tools that can minimize the price fluctuation. Contract farming, eh? when I did that in Malaysia, for example, eh? uh, in like Amal, they have hedging, eh? yeah? futures market, all this. Uh, all these are basically the tools that we can minimize the risk. Not to eliminate the, eliminate the risk, impossible, but to minimize the risk. And secondly, of course, is natural, I would say, natural hazard. Bencana alam, eh? hazard. Eh? There are a lot. Eh? That sometimes there is a flood. Eh? Uh, some, sometimes there is some hole in uh, pests and diseases. Eh? And sometimes there is uh, climatic, you know, because of El Nino, El Nino, and so forth. Eh? So this all will affect the yield of the crops. Eh? So these are basically the, I would say, the pertinent, not to say the significant problem in upstream agriculture. But number one, still business. That's why um, in developed countries like Taiwan, Korea, Japan, I mean, not talking about US and everything, just look at our side. They have what you call early warning system by the government. Early warning system. System Amaran Awal, uh, meaning that they know when the price will decline. They know when there is a flood. They know, basically, they can project when is, for example, that it will be high temperature, for example. Right? Especially the price. So if we have a good tools that we can predict the price, then of course we can put it in the early warning system and basically we can know 
What would be the price of palm oil until the end of the year? What would be the price of chicken until the end of the year? That's why, I mean, basically I'm teaching normally one cost used to be in uh, agriculture uh, the forecasting. Yeah, this is my area also. Uh, those who are interested to, to learn this, uh, you can invite me to Jember, lah, no problem. <laughs> I will teach one of them. So how can we forecast the price of certain product? All these are the tools basically to minimize risk. So that is normally the main problem in the upstream sector. The main problem in the downstream sector are normally in terms of the food safety issues and a lot. Food safety issues in Malaysia, in Malaysia, and also the competitor. So normally if we look at agriculture, at the farm levels, is a good example of pure competition. I'm sure those who learn in economics or managerial economics, classical examples of pure competition is agriculture at the farm levels. Why? Because the product is more or less homogeneous. I mean, palm oil produced in Malaysia, palm oil produced in Indonesia, they are look the same. Chicken produced in Malaysia, Chicken produced in Sumatra or in Jember, they are the same basically. Chicken are chicken. But at the downstream, this is where product differentiation is very important. You see? If we cannot differentiate our products, then of course our business is nowhere. Look at the chicken. I'm sure in Indonesia they have Kentucky Fried Chicken selling chicken. McDonald selling chicken, uh, Burger King selling chicken. Uh, in Malaysia, we have Ayam Mas selling chicken. All those are selling chicken. But they said KFC chicken is better than McDonald chicken. McDonald said McDonald chicken is better than Burger King chicken. All these are product differentiation. So, meaning that in the downstream activities, to be successful, in a business, we must able to differentiate our product. Uh, this is what a good, uh, in, in economic, they call it, up here, bukan monopoly, monopolistic competition. Uh, they call it the market is monopolistic competition, where there are a lot of product differentiation. The price normally tend to be stable at the downstream. But the price upstream, very volatile. But at downstream, the price is very stable. But in order for us to be success, we must be able to our product differentiation so that we can be ahead with our competitor. So this is basically some of my comment, eh? talking about the main issues in the downstream and also the main issues in the upstream of agriculture. Thank you. I hope, I hope I give some response uh, into in the of your question. Thank you very much. Next question. Yeah, yeah uh, from Bapak Laude. In the uh, developing a uh, livestock business in Malaysia, do you have any obstacles from um, governance policy? And do you have a strategy to solve that? A livestock business. Yeah, livestock business in Malaysia. What kind of factors uh, do you have any obstacles uh, in doing uh, the livestock business, um, especially from uh, government policy? Okay. Put it this way. Livestock basically, or animal, or uh, meat. I'm not sure in Indonesia, but in Malaysia, we categorize into ruminant and non-ruminant. Non-ruminant, like chicken, everything. Chicken, layers, uh, telur ayam. So normally, we are doing very well. We export a lot of chicken to Singapore. We export a lot of uh, eggs to Singapore, basically. I think as far as non-ruminant, we are okay. 
But the problem in livestock business is the ruminant in the cattle industry and also in dairy industry. This is our problem. And also of late, somehow, I don't know Indonesia, we like to eat lamb now. Kambing. So this is a new, new trend in Malaysia. We have to have lamb. So before the pandemic, if we have Hari Raya, we have open house. Eh? Open house. Indonesia, you have open house also, Dr. Siti? Yes, we also have open house. Uh, there must be kambing. Pandemic, yeah. <laughs> uh, before pandemic, of course, for the past two years, we don't have any open <laughs> house. Kambing, yeah. Gulai Bukan kambing. Sate. Bukan. Itu grill kambing. Grill. Oh, ba bakar, bakar. Panggang. Ah, bakar, bakar. Yeah. It's a new trend now in, in Malaysia. Five years ago, we don't have that. But now, I don't know, probably the people income are uh, improving. There is a new taste somehow. People like to eat kambing now. <laughs> so the demand for kambing, for lamb, lah, for lamb, lah, uh, is, uh, not, the demand for lamb is increasing over the years. Eh? No. But for ruminant, talking about beef cattle, talking about dairy, talking about lamb just now, a goat, lamb, lamb is a daging, yeah, goat is the animal. This is where we are still lagging behind. Our self-sufficiency level, self-sufficiency level means our production for beef is only about 23%. That means the rest we still have to import. Our, our fresh milk, our SSL is about 60%. And 40% we have to import. For lamb, kambing just now, our SSL is only 5%. And 95% we have to import. No. This is our scenario of livestock industry in Malaysia. To ask the question, of course, the government has a lot of incentive given to those who want to have a livestock business. Huh? For example, the government gave a free, in Bahasa, they call Padang Ragot, of pasture. That means, if you have your beef cattle, you can bring your cattle to the pasture area. That pasture is managed by the Department of Veterinary Services. You can just bring your animal on. And of course, the government have a lot of incentive in terms of grant for those who want to do pit lotting. Pit lot, eh? mean you import the animal and you fatten the animal. That's called pit lotting. I'm sure there are a lot in Indonesia also. Eh? So, and then of course, there are a lot of grant given for those who want to have dairy farming industry. For, milk, for fresh milk, a lot of grant. So, so in terms of incentive, there are a lot of grants. But the problem in Malaysia actually is not the government incentive. There are a lot, no problem. There is no obstacle as far as as far as grant from the government. But the problem in Malaysian agriculture is actually entrepreneurship. So basically. From my study, there are three components to be success in food production or in food security of certain nations. Number one is in terms of policy. Number two is in terms of technology. And thirdly is in terms of the people, which is entrepreneur. In terms of policy, I think similar in Indonesia. In Malaysia, everywhere you go, you can see oil pump. There are a lot of oil pumps. Those who come to Malaysia, I mean, right from the airport, let's say you go to Kuala Lumpur, on your left, on your right, there are just oil pumps, basically. Okay? But the fact that there are more oil pumps, which is about 5 million hectares, and of course, Indonesia is the biggest producer of oil pump, of palm oil, the fact that there are a lot of oil palm plantation is because the return from oil palm 
is more lucrative compared to the return from food production. But I'm not saying that the return from food production is not profitable. Yes, they are profitable. But the return is more in oil palm. That's why the government give a lot of incentive, a lot of subsidies, so that the return in food production is at least similar, at least at par with the return in oil palm production. So that there are more of in terms of food production for food security purposes. Second is the technology. Of course, government, a lot of incentive if we want to buy technology. Mechanization, not talking about sensor, robotic and everything, smart farming. But mission problem actually is the people, the entrepreneur. That's why uh, I always said that when I was young last time, <clears throat> No, I hope still young also. Right? When I was young last time, when we developed the program, actually the objective of the program, Bachelor of Science in Agriculture, Bachelor of Science in Animal Science, everything. The objective then, talking about 30 years ago, is to produce human capital that can work in the government and private sector. It's enough. That time, 30 years ago. We never talked about entrepreneur this time. But now, the objective of the program, academic program, other than producing human capital for, for private and for public sector is to develop entrepreneurs. Unless we can have entrepreneurs as a farmers, because the farmers are the one who are very old people, things like that. Eh? Unless we have entrepreneurs who are I mean, farmers who have entrepreneurs attribute, then I think uh, our food security, our food production, our less industry uh, can, can improve over the years. Eh? So to answer that question, yes, but as far as livestock industry in Malaysia, the government have given a lot of incentive uh, in terms of policy, in terms of inputs, in terms of technology, but yet we have farmers who are entrepreneurs. Unless we have farmers who are entrepreneurs who are basically can uh, use the tool of project planning and management, those who can use minimize risk, then I think the livestock industry in Malaysia or food industry or food production industry in Malaysia will be much for me. So that's basically my, my comment. Okay, thank you. Very clear uh, answer. Uh, okay, we have uh, Muhammad Farga, Farhan here. Yeah, please. Can... Mm, okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well, thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Muhammad Farhan Gazi and I'm from Ravijaya University, Faculty of Animal Science. Um, agricultural business requires a large area of land, which means that we have to have a lot of budgets to start a business from zero. Not just the agricultural business, but almost every business needs a place to do their business, right? My question is, what do you think about borrowing from banks or other um, agencies to buy land, or we can just rent the land? Thank you. Okay. Uh... It's very difficult question to answer because it depends on the project itself and also depends on the scenario. Okay. Leasing or buying certain asset in business. Really is business decision. If renting is cheaper compared to buying, then might as well rent the land. At least the land. But if buying is cheaper in business, then of course you can buy the land. Eh? Because not leasing the land is not only for five years. You can lease the land for 10 years, for 30 years, and so forth. So having a business in agriculture is not necessary to buy the inputs. It's not necessary to buy the land. If leasing the land is cheaper, 
then might as well lease the land or rent the land. There are a lot of business who are renting land actually. They don't own the land, but it's cheaper to. But that uh, Muhammad Farhan, to do that, of course, you have to do the budgeting, capital budgeting. You have to compare, you know, yeah, I lease the land for 30 years. What would be the cost? If I buy the land, what would be the cost? Is buying the land cheaper? You can buy the land. Okay, now, there is subject about the land. It depends also on the business itself. Now, land for certain agriculture is not a very important input. For vegetable production, for example, there are a lot of uh, what you call smart farming. Now, there are a lot of plant factory, actually. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of plant factory. They are like bangunan, the first floor, let's say broccoli, the second floor, cabbage, the third floor, other, other type of vegetables. Actually, the land is not becoming important for certain, for certain business. But for livestock, yes, of course. Let's start talking about beef cattle. Yes, I think the land is still very important. <laughs> you can do uh, uh, but the technology now, but who knows? 10 years from now, we can produce meat from the factory. I do not know. That is technology. But of course, in vegetable production, we can produce from plant factory. There are a lot of urban farming, actually, in Kuala Lumpur, for example. Eh? I visited the other day. Because of this pandemic, that person ran a parking space of a mall. You see mall? Uh, super, super mall, supermarket mall, mall for. So there are a lot of parking, right? Layers of parking. So he ran one floor of parking converted into urban farming. You see? So kat situ, all uh, they plant everything in the parking, <laughs> parking space. Of course, he ran. Lah. He ran. He ran, he ran lah. So... So this kind of uh, business. Eh? So to answer your question, Parhan, you should have to do certain analysis whether leasing or purchasing is cheaper. And for certain type of business now, with all this technology, land is becoming, I would say, of course, talking about 30, 40 years ago, to do agriculture, to do farming, land is very important. You don't have land, you cannot become farmers. But now, you become farmers, by renting a parking space. And of course, that person wearing a tie, you know, farmers wearing a tie. <laughs> because it's very good situation. Because he's very educated. He's ingenious, actually, ingenious. Of course, uh, we visited, of course, my friend in agronomy will advise him, everything. Because entrepreneurs is different breed of people. Not as he graduate in agriculture. But then, of course, he can learn. Huh? All the all the system actually hydroponic system. He used hydroponic system. He ran a parking space and become a farmer. And he wear ties anyway. Huh? So now becoming farmers is not under the sun anymore. Is in the parking space. <laughs> this is this is a real story. This is a real story. Uh, in the parking space, a real story. So to answer your question, yes, of course. That's my comment basically. Eh? Uh, of course, you have to do the. This is very important, uh, Farhan. Eh? Uh, uh, business plan is very, very important for you to involve in business. Eh? Um, to minimize the risk, uh, you have to do the market research. You have to know who are your competitors, who are to know your product. You have to differentiate your product and everything. That should be included in your business plan. And present your business plan to the people industry. And present the business plan in the in the group bank in the in the bank and of course one more thing just now you're talking about money eh? actually when you talk to business people they are somehow they said in business we use other people money to make money and this is what they say use other people money to make money of course i'm not business fan i'm okay i just i just talking to business people Business people will, won't, will not use their own money to do business. They use other people's money to do business. Of course, you have to have money to make money. Uh, this is where they can look at the bank. If your business is successful, the bank will come to you, Farhan. 
Uh, but of course, industry you have to approach the bank. <laughs> but when business are uh, business successful, the bank will come to you because the bank also have to survive by giving loan. <laughs> so this is the thing. Yeah. So of course, loan is very very important. Yeah. It's the business. That's why project plan is very important. Don't use your money. Probably you can use ten percent of your money, but ninety percent by loan. Actually, yeah, by loan. Yeah? So of course you have to minimize for this. Lah. There are a lot of agreement with the bank and everything. Huh? So how the agreement looks like? Huh? But of course in Malaysia, of course in Indonesia there are a lot of bullock. I think huh? I, I, I may understand there are a lot of bullocks in Malaysia. Also we have a lot of this that can give a grant to young entrepreneur. Sometimes they give grant up to in ringgit, hundred thousand ringgit, some up to three thousand ringgit. Huh? So this grant sometimes is just upright, and sometimes is very low, very very low interest rate. So I'm sure in Indonesia they have this kind of grant. Don't go to the commercial bank. Uh, well, of course I talk to the student. Don't go to commercial bank. They will charge very high. There are a lot of grant by the ministry, by the bulog, that for young people like Farhan to enter the business in farming. Yeah? There are a lot. So then use utilize all this grant for you to start up your business. Yeah, talking talking about land, yeah. In Netherlands, they have floating uh, floating agri uh, livestock farming. So ah. in Indonesia, like uh, uh, terapung, peternakan terapung. Yeah, they have a uh, floating yeah floating farming. So how, how, I think how, how the floating farming? How to the animal? Yeah, uh, the water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, floating. So like they have a, a kind of farming, but. Uh, they just float it in the water, yeah. So they don't have to buy land for them. But I don't know how, how the procedure, but I just read yesterday about that floating um, oh. livestock farming. Where, 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 where is it in Indonesia? Netherlands. No, Netherlands. Only Netherlands. Netherlands. Yeah, Netherlands, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, one solution, yeah. Kind of oh, solution yeah. for a uh, farming problem, uh, land uh, problem. Of, uh, scarcity of the land, huh? So yeah. they so they use water not only to raise the fish, but they use water to raise the food. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Air fun, maybe. Yeah. 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 It's a new we technology. Have, yeah. Good morning for uh, yeah. some students. Yeah. Maybe in Indonesia, we have also a good uh, example about the floating uh, farm. Yeah. In the Kalimantan, yeah, in Borneo, yeah, in the south of Borneo. We have a floating farm with the duck, duck, yeah, you know okay. duck. Yeah, we have a typical duck, yeah, for 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 egg production. Uh, we call that the alabio duck, yeah. The farmer uh, uh, construct the the housing of the duck is uh, uh, in the floating, yeah, because the in Mal in Kalimantan, lot of a lake, yeah. So most of the land is a lake. So the, the farmer create the, the housing of the duck is the up of the water. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It, it's real, yeah. Yeah. I saw the, they nampak telur, how, how the egg, how they how they capture the eggs in water? No, they 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 have a cake uh, up of the water. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So the eggs not in the water, but still in the in the cake. In yeah. the cake, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's a battery battery system, isn't it? Yeah, yeah battery. Yeah. Battery system. Yeah, okay. we have only ten minutes, but we yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we have three questions. Maybe I I can wrap up the questions. Yeah, from um from Clara Rafi. Uh, Pak Edi and Harry Damayanti, yeah, about the market research, we already talked about it, and pandemic, we also talked about the uh, how to run the business during the pandemic, and um, policy, yeah, policy, we also talked about it, and Harry Damayanti asked, branding is important thing in building a business. I want to ask, how do we build our business Friend identity. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. I think I think this is very, very. I think very, very good question. Yeah? Mm. Uh, in business, in fact, in everything in our life, branding is very important. Image, we call it image, very important. 
I always, I always talk to my students. Uh, when you graduate later, each one of you must have your own brand. How to do that? Each one of you must create your own product differentiation. See? So, so normally, so I always talk to my students, later when you graduate to get a job, there might be one opening and there might be 50 people attending the interview. Or there might be 100 people applying for that job. And finally, they shortlisted only 20 people called for interview. And only one people we got the job. So I said, is to do that, you must create your own brand. As a student, as a graduate, my own brand. Reporter. Meaning that you must be different from others. Your CV must be different. The way you talk must be different. The way you dress must be different. Everything. In order to be different. Why? If you are just the same as others, then how the employer will want to hire you? You must have something different, something added value I mean, eh? compared to others. So this is basically general in life. So also in the university, as a lecturer normally, why people can get got professor at the age of 40 years old? Some people get professor at the age of 50 years old. It's because of image, because of the branding that they have. So, in business, branding is very, very important. Branding is not only branding, but branding in terms of image of your products. Number one, your product must be different from others. And that's number one. So product differentiation is very, very important in business. You must, those who are entering new business, your product must have different value, must have different added value compared to the existing product that they have in the market. It's no point you sell a exactly similar products. That's number one you have to think. Eh? So that's why in market research, one of the thing is to look, to look at competitors' product. What are the products that are available in the market? And what can you offer? a better product. This is called product positioning. What are the attributes? What are the added value of product? That's very important. So let's say, for example, like chicken. Uh, chicken, I think, is a very good example. KFC, for example, Kentucky Fried Chicken, I'm sure there are a lot of KFC in Indonesia, has been selling chicken over the years. Since I was small, KFC has been selling, selling chicken. But currently, in Malaysia, there is also ayam mas. Ayam mas, ayam mas, <laughs> selling chicken also. But ayam mas, when they enter the market, they are not selling chicken like KFC. It's no point. They have their own taste. Because KFC is Western taste, actually. I mean, because KFC starts from US. So the taste is, you go to KFC in Malaysia, you go to KFC in, in somewhere in New York, the taste will be the same. But Ayamas, they create Malaysian taste. I mean, they are just pedas pedas, you know, uh -huh. uh, a bit of uh, what you call rempah uh, ratus de life, which is very suitable for our taste. Uh, this is called product differentiation. That means Ayamas, when they want to do business, you know, because KFC is very common, Western taste, very oily, eh? banyak, banyak minyak. Now ayam must come out with the taste which are very, okay, very lichen, I mean, which is very suitable for the Malaysian taste, for, for Indonesian taste, for, I think for that matter. They are pedas sikit, they are rasa rempah sedikit, eh? and things like that. But ayam still ayam. That's why ayam must can survive. So meaning that, yes, Branding, image very important, but how to do that is by having a product differentiation. Eh? So ni pelajar-pelajar uh, Farhan yang lain tu nak graduate nanti. Farhan must be different from kawan-kawan lain. How? 
you speak better you speak better english contohnya you dress better you know, everything must be different ah <laughs> uh, you you and your this are your friend and your potential competitor to get a job i mean if you want, if you want to get the job later lah then what are what are the employers looking at you uh, now there are a lot of multinational multinational basically then of course english is very important Of course, bahasa Indonesia is very important. Bahasa Malaysia is very important. But then, of course, we're talking work in the multinational. You might on, you might not only be posted in Indonesia, but you might one day posted in Malaysia, posted in Dubai, posted in New York. Of course, English is very very important. Yeah. So this is why product differentiation. That's basically to answer the question. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Not, but that is basically. Yeah, uh, it was very inspiring. Students uh, remember that. Um, yeah, remember someone I said that. Association, remember that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. Students uh, remember that someone said that if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, good, yeah. Well, this seminar is very important for you to um, remember that you have to plan uh, before you do your uh, project. Yeah. So uh, here we come to the end of the seminars. Uh, Prof Nasir Samsudin, can you give us some close statement for us yeah, to motivate our students to do better projects and for their future, of course. Thank you very much. Um, uh, probably I already touched already. That of course, uh, or normally this I talk to my students also. Uh, Now, after graduate, working, become workers is should be the second in your mind. During my time, or during uh, Dr. Aziza time or Dr. Irfan time, when we graduate last time, we want to work with the government or work with the private sector. That was then. That was then. But now. When you graduate, you must be talking about yes, I want to have a business. That should be should be the case now. So I want to business. But the thing is, universities, we are lecturers. We are not business people. That's why the responsibility of the university also is to work together with people with the business people in order to produce business people. <laughs> so we need to know. So meaning that the students. When you graduate, put in your mind that you want to become entrepreneurs. It's what Prophet Muhammad said. 90% of the rezeki is from business. Actually, Dr. Aziza must say, Dr. Ifan, we are taking the 10% only. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we know that 90% is there on the other side, but we are competing for the 10%. I don't know about mine. This is all mine, huh? but we should compete. The 90% there. Prophet already said that. It must be, well, Prophet said it must be true. So 90%. So come up with the business because, of course, being business, there are a lot of risks. A lot of hard work have to be done. If many students become business people, of course, their life is very much busier compared to people like working in the, in the government. Yeah? But the thing is, with better planning, That's why project planning management is very very important. With better planning, with better uh, with hard work and everything, I think inshallah you can be successful. There are a lot of my students successful businessmen, where the lecturers is just driving a Toyota, I mean normal car. They come to see me driving Mercedes, driving BMW, things like that. Why they drive Mercedes BMW? I'm sure their income is much better. <laughs> so this is the thing. Eh? So things that you know, the first thing to our mind is to become business. There are a lot, and there are a lot of business opportunities. Of course, the post-pandemic. Now we're talking about the pandemic. There are post-pandemic. Look at the issues now. There, are, I'm sure there are a lot of business opportunities post-pandemic. Eh? When things are uh, open up the market, uh, I mean the the the, the, the economy uh, open up later. Now digital marketing, digital business is very very important. Eh? A lot of digital uh, now. Eh? So look at the digital, come up with the apps and everything. So these are I would say 
business in the future. Eh? Now talking about smart farming, eh? using the drone, everything. So if you not become the farmer, you might also the business selling the drone. Sell the sensor, there's also business in agriculture. So there are a lot, a lot of business opportunities after the, after the pandemic. So, so thank you very much. That is basically my, you know, thank you very my much. kind of message. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I hope, uh, I, hope I will be invited again next year. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Ivan, do you have uh, something to uh, tell? Yeah, I think it's uh, very inspiring what you already presenting by the professor Nasir Samsudin. Yeah, thank you very much thank for you. your sharing. Yeah, for your yeah, it's very important for for our student to develop the what is the the passion yeah, to make uh, uh, as a uh, uh, entrepreneurship, yeah, because the my uh, university, Brawijaya University, is already uh, the claim that the will be as the entrepreneur university. Yeah, ah. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you, participants. Yeah, uh, here we have to say goodbye and uh, thank you for the great moments of uh, Nasir Samsudin and thank you for a great experience and knowledge you share with us. Okay, thank you all. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe and uh, stay healthy, Prof. Samsudin. Thank you. Thank you very much. You too. You are. Okay, thank you.